any concerns. So with that, with that out of the way, welcome. This is the final Astrophysics McGill public live stream, live stream of the year before the holidays. And tonight we have Professor Matt Dobbs from McGill University, who's going to tell us about how we can enable new probes of the cosmos with novel technology. So throughout the talk, if you're on Zoom, you can type questions into the chat uh, and we will answer them at the end. If you're on YouTube, you can type questions into the YouTube comments. And again, we'll feed them to Matt at the end of the talk. So uh, Matt's gonna talk for uh, between 30, 40 minutes, something like that. Then we'll have questions and the event will end off around 8 p.m. So that out of the way, Matt, please take it away. Great, thank you. Okay, um, you should be looking at my screen and see see the, the cover slide. Today I'm going to be talking about technology. I'm going to be talking about science and how we explore the cosmos and the universe and see journey to places we've never before been. And it's going to seem like a story of technology. Maybe it'll seem like a story of science. But really underneath this all, I wanna emphasize that everything I'm gonna talk about is really a story about people. People and their creativity, putting together new instruments, dreaming up new ways of doing things, implementing that as technology, and then using that to journey across the cosmos to see uh, and experience new things. Um, I'm... I'm incredibly lucky because I'm paid every day to go to work and try to answer the questions that I find to be the most exciting questions that can be asked. And that may sound like a really conceited thing to say, but actually I hope and I expect that every scientist and many people in many fields feel the same way about what they do. Certainly the scientists, whether they're economists or psychologists or chemists or whatever they are, I hope that they, they get to feel the same way about their work. For me, the big questions, the reason that I go to work to build things are questions like these. And the upper left is just an artist's interpretation of the beginning of things, how things started maybe uh, with something like a Big Bang evolving through an expanding growing universe to eventually accelerated expansion and where we are today on planet earth how it all began, the equations, the physics that define the beginning of the universe drive me in figuring out how to look at the cosmos. That's one big question. Another big question are the unspeakably large explosions that are going on across the night sky every night, it turns out. And what you're seeing in, in the lower right is just an example of how a telescope might see the sky, this green rectangle. And flowing through is the night sky as the Earth turns. So of course, as our Earth spins, the sky rotates overhead. Other way around, the sky is mostly static and the Earth is spinning. And every once in a while, our telescope is looking up and it captures an explosion that outshines the entire night sky, everything else out there. And that's like, that's pretty intense technology or equations or physics that's doing that. And we don't quite understand how it works yet. It puts our sun and the engines of uh, other astrophysical objects to shame these explosions. So I'd love to understand how these uh, fast radio transits, the, these bursts, explosions of light on the night sky work. Other people are using telescopes for very exciting things, asking questions like, are, is there anybody else out there? Is there advanced civilizations far away that's watching our TV stations? Or maybe, if I'm lucky somehow, listening to this live stream right now with their big telescopes tuned in on Earth. Um, are, are we alone out there? Lots of exciting questions that we are answering uh, or looking at today with our telescopes. And many of these we have very little information about so far. So, this story then of telescopes, of technology is really one, not just of science, but of exploration. Sometimes I wake up and I think, man, I wished in a, I lived in a time when there are still things to explore on Earth. And of course there are. We look down inside the atom and inside the proton at ever detailed levels in particle physics, things right here on Earth. And we look up at the night sky 
and we journey to different regions. So the explorers of yesterday were um, journeying around, for example, the first circumnavigation of the globe with the Victoria shown on the left, or being launched into space as humankind journeying through its uh, first ad adventure beyond Earth. Here's Yuri Gagarin in, in, in the Vostok uh, exploring space for the first time. The version of exploration I'm talking about today, and I really want to call it exploration as opposed to astronomy or seeing things out there. The journey of exploration I'm talking about today is one that's enabled with telescopes, like the one in the lower right corner. This is the South Pole Telescope. It sits right at the bottom of the planet at the geographic South Pole. And it's one that our team worked uh, together with others. And there's uh, a, a, a bunch of us in front of the telescope uh, the day before we turned it on for, for the first time. Uh, a, a machine that's an exploration vehicle just like these. So let's just remember how this works. We can, and, and I, I realize people have been uh, attending these and are experts in things like this already, but let's just take a moment to remember what our exploration vehicles are like. This telescope can be steered and pointed to different regions of the sky. It can explore the night sky spatially, look here or there. But unlike the other two vehicles that are shown on the screen, this exploration vehicle is also a time machine. And of course, the reason that works is that light travels at a fixed speed. So here I am in this room and I can look back at my back wall and it's about 10 feet away. And so what I see when I look at my, my back wall is not my back wall as it exists right now. My back wall that I see with my eyes is exactly as it existed about 10 nanoseconds ago because it takes light about 10 nanoseconds to be emitted in that wall and reach my detector, my exploration vehicle here in, in front of me. And so it is, if I look at the sun, I can only see the sun as it was about eight minutes ago. When I look out across the cosmos, the nearest next uh, a star is Alpha Centauri. And so I look at Alpha Centauri, which is four light years away as it was four years ago. If something revolutionary happened on Alpha Centauri, if whatever happened there and exploded and disappeared, I wouldn't know about it for four years. So I explore Alpha Centauri as it was four years ago. And indeed, the telescopes I'm most interested in, like the South Pole, is looking not at Alpha Centauri, the nearest star, not through our galaxy, not at the next galaxies, not at the first stars that were created to form those galaxies, but beyond all of that to, in this case, the cosmic microwave background that was created just a fraction of a time after the beginning of the universe, about 380,000 years after the beginning of the universe. So this telescope is an exploration vehicle. It can move and see different parts of the night sky, but way more important than that, it's a time machine. And it can take us as passengers, all of us that benefit from it, and look back in time in the very first instance in, in the beginning uh, and evolution of our cosmos. So it's, um, it's a pretty exciting time and place to be, to be able to look through telescopes like this. Before we go into our today's technology, let's pause for one more minute and appreciate how lucky we are to do this today. Here I am sitting uh, you know, in my desk at work, I'm actually at home, but whatever, that's COVID. Um, here I am you know, doing my job building telescopes and our government, our society, you as taxpayers are supporting this. And we're answering questions about our origins, questions about how we came to be, and we're doing it out of pure curiosity. There's very little that's going to benefit our economy, that's going to benefit our health, our uh, longevity in terms of our lifespan because of this. And we're able to do that because we're very privileged in our society here in Canada and many countries around the world, the majority of them actually spend a substantial amount on these sorts of pursuits. And it's, it's very uh, uh, exciting and lucky for me to live in this time when we're able uh, to do this. So let's, um, let's, let's see where we are with, with telescopes uh, today. Now, ultimately, if I could, I would build the ultimate telescope. And I'm gonna limit our discussion today to radio telescopes because that's where I spend most of my time right now. Remember the radio band means that we're looking at light, the same light that you see with your eye, but instead of being uh, a few hundred nanometers in wavelength, we're talking about wavelengths that are macroscopic in scale. So one of the most exciting wavelengths to me is 21 centimeters. It's the light that's emitted from just normal hydrogen. And it's about this big. So most of the things you're gonna see in the telescopes I show you are macroscopic in scale. Our antennas are about the size of our wavelength. And at this wavelength, we're able to do amazing things because we can set up our telescopes so that we actually measure light 
uh, more than once per wavelength, that our pixels, our antennas can be spaced close enough together that we actually sample the waveform directly. So that's the region that, that we're gonna be in today. What I'd love to be able to build, what I'd love to be able to use is a telescope that is first of all, limited only in its sensitivity by the randomness of the sky, the noise of the night sky. Let me just remind you about that concept. There's a light bulb behind me up here. And this light bulb, of course, all it does is it emits photons. It emits, emits particles of light. And you might think that if you took an image, it's constant. But if I had a really good telescope and I looked at that light, I would be able to count the number of photons that came out. And the number of photons that come out per second is actually a random number. It has a distribution. We know its statistics, but it's different this second from that second from the next second. There is some inherent noise, even though that light bulb is st stable and very well built, that, uh, that I can't get past. And the sky is the same way. If I look up at, uh, at a, a known source in the sky, there's some randomness in what I see, not because it's changing, but because it obeys physical laws that emit a random number of photons per second. And I'd love to have a telescope that was limited by that sensitivity. And actually in the millimeter band, we do that. We build pixels that have some inherent fluctuation, but the fluctuation is smaller than the fluctuation of the night sky. The next thing is I want images that aren't blurry. I wanna be able to zoom in on the images and see very fine structures. I want exquisite, really good angular resolution so that I can see big things on the sky and I can see small things. And wow, I was really careful because I didn't say nearby things and far away things. It turns out that seeing very far away doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be able to see very small things. So the telescope I showed you in the lower right-hand corner, the South Pole telescope, has relatively terrible angular resolution, but it sees as far or further than any other telescope built. It sees right back to the first light. So these things are a little bit different. I wish I could build a telescope that would see as much of the sky as possible. I'd love to see everything that's above me. And so uh, a, a lot of uh, field of view, a lot of overhead sky is important. I'd like to be able to see every color that's out there. I'm in the radio band. So when I say color, I just mean I want to see this wavelength and I want to see longer wavelengths than shorter wavelengths. I'd like a lot of that. And that's going to turn out to be really important for interpreting what we see. Finally, one of the important transitions that's happening today is we're moving away from uh, telescopes that take exposures, that make images of the night sky, towards telescopes that are always recording movies. They're taking exposures very, very quickly so that in real time, we can not just see what's, what the sky looks like, but we can detect any sudden change and follow that up, uh, both with that telescope and other telescopes. So I'd like an ultra fast exposure rate. Now, in, uh, throughout the last hundred years, the status quo, the normal telescope would take uh, an amplifier, the thing that sits right behind the antenna and, and amplifies the signal so that we can see a very faint things. It would take an amplifier, which isn't that expensive to build, but it would have to take that and cool it down to cryogenic temperatures. It would make it uh, four degrees above absolute zero or something like that. And that's incredibly expensive. It might cost a million dollars in instrumentation to cool that pixel. And so we typically would put just one antenna or a few antennas on a telescope. And then we did instead spend all of our money to build a really big telescope dish, like the one shown in the right-hand corner, which is the relatively modern and new fast telescope that was turned on in China a few, a few years ago. That mammoth beast there is half a kilometer wide. It is just an immense uh, scientific instrument. Um, and this is how telescopes have traditionally been built in the radio band. Make the dish really big and, and uh, so that you spend your money there and make the amplifiers and the antennas relatively few because those, those are very, very expensive. The other thing that we spend a lot of money on in, in the past is making sure that we can steer the dish. So great big radio telescopes that you can move across the sky. This thing that you see, uh, the fast telescope is actually steerable. The bottom dish, the big round structure, the satellite-like dish that you see there doesn't move, but there's a secondary dish, a mirror that sits above it that's suspended by those six towers and it can move around so that it effectively, by moving the secondary dish, which you can't see in that image, it's quite small. By moving that around, you can point this telescope to different regions of, of the sky. And by doing that, you have fantastic angular resolution is how small you, uh, of a thing you see is proportional to one over the size of the dish, but you have to make a choice to look here or there. This has been the, the, the status quo in radio astronomy for years. 
The change that has been taking place over the last decade, two decades, uh, over the last decade, is that it's become really inexpensive to build amplifiers, to build the system that sits behind the antenna, such that you no longer need to cool them to very low temperatures. Indeed, the box that I'm showing in the left-hand side is an amplifier that was custom built for our Chime telescope. Um, and it costs maybe a hundred bucks now. Remember the price tag I put on, on, on the other one in the lower left corner was a million dollars. So it's gone way down in price. And some of the students in our, our uh, astro, astro group now are buying amplifiers almost as good as these off Amazon for 30 bucks and building their backyard telescopes with them. So the cost of these things has gone way, way down. And that's changed the equation for what I would choose to build in a telescope. The telescope I choose to build today is radically different from what people chose to build 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, so that's, that's where, where our change is coming from. Now with my telescope, I would like to be in a situation where I don't point and choose a little area of the sky, but instead what I do is I map as much of the sky as possible. So I'm first gonna show you how our Chime telescope works and then take you on to the next step, the, the important thing, well, the, the main topic of this talk today, the cord telescope. So the Chime telescope looks different from most telescopes that you've seen. And I'm sure many, many of you have been to lectures in this series that include science from the Chime telescope, or maybe a lecture I gave about a year and a half ago on how the telescope itself works. It looks different, and, and you're seeing this, and you're probably thinking it looks different because they're cylinders. But the first thing I want to point out is that this looks different because nothing moves. There is not a single motor, ball bearing, or anything in this telescope that allows it to move or scan different regions of the sky. Don't get me wrong, we can point this telescope but we do it within our whole data set and we look within everything that the telescope sees by using computers and signal processing. So that's the important first thing is that these new telescopes are not pointed and steered, but collect data from a large swath of the sky. And we sort that data out with our computers. The other thing that's unique about this telescope, of course, is the thing that jumps out of your eyes. It's not a round circular satellite like dish but it's a cylinder. And that's gonna end up being the not so important part of this story as I go on to show you one. So let's just, just look at how, how this works for a moment. Uh, I've drawn one of the cylinders in the left-hand side and I put an antenna at its focus. And um, I'm, I'm gonna orient this cylinder such this is the north direction and this is the south direction, okay? And I've taken on the right-hand side, I've drawn the whole overhead sky as a blue region and then the part of the sky that this telescope sees is the red, red cigar shaped region. And you can see why that is. Any light that comes in from this direction will bounce off this flat mirror and land here, no matter where it's coming from. If it's coming from up here, it'll take a small angle and hit this. But in the other direction, it behaves just like a normal telescope dish and it focuses down our field of view to a narrow stripe in the east-west direction. In, in the orthogonal direction. So that's why I've draw, drawn this as a cigar superimposed on the overhead sky. So that's what it looks like uh, uh, in more detail, but this time I've taken the sky and uh, I've drawn what's really out there, the radio light that we expect to see. And what you can see is that the sky is rotating around a point and that shouldn't surprise any of us because when you look up at the night, night sky, there's the North Star. And that's just the place in the night sky where the, where the axis of the earth, the North Pole points to. And every day as the earth spins, our night sky turns around that north celestial pole. So what this telescope sees is this red cigar shaped uh, stripe. The overhead sky is the round region. And then the parts that are behind planet earth are shown in the oval region here, just so that you can see it all. And you can see that once per night as the earth turns, everything rotates through our beam. Everything rotates such that we get to see it. But this so far is the worst telescope you could imagine. <laughs> because it can't discern between light that's emitted at the top of the cigar or the bottom of the cigar. It can't tell the difference whether light came from the left-hand side or the right-hand side. So I have to do more to figure out what's going on in this stripe. Um, so here, here's the stripe again and the same picture I showed. Let me take this cylinder down. Instead of putting one antenna in it, I'm going to put 16 antennas in. And what that allows me to do with a good big computer and a lot of signal processing algorithms, a lot of compute power, is that I can take all the information that's arriving at each one of these antennas and calculate what's going on at 16 different points because there are 16 antennas 
within that cigar shaped thing. So I end up being able to form regions within the beam that I'm able to measure. And I'm gonna do that again in the other direction. I'm gonna build more cylinders in the east-west direction. And once I do that, I'm taking that whole stripe and I'm dividing it up so that I can, I can start to make an image of what's seen. That's, that's everything I need to see the whole sky every single day. Because I have that stripe, I have all these antennas and these big computers that process it, and I get to image what's in the stripe, but then I wait 24 hours and, and the whole overhead sky, everything that's out there uh, um, in the sky rotates through my beam and I'm able to process that and see what's going on. So let's just take a, a quick uh, aerial view of what, what this telescope looks like. This is the CHIME telescope. It is the first telescope, the first major research telescope that we've built in Canada in the last 30 years. It's a major uh, step forward in, in astronomy and in Canada asserting itself as a big player in radio astronomy. The north-south direction is about 80 meters and each one of these cylinders is about 20 meters wide. And it's backed by this massive computer that's processing roughly the same amount of data every second as all of our internet across Canada. And it's that difference, that ability to process that data and that difference, the ability to build very low cost individual antennas and amplifiers that's driving this transformation of what telescopes look like. Okay, the last thing I wanna do, or the other thing in my list was I want really rapid exposures. And it turns out we didn't realize this till, uh, oh, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It turns out that if you look up at the sky and you're able to make exposures that are a millisecond long, you'll see these fantastic bursts of light that I tried, tried to image or show in that first intro slide of science questions. There is some sort of explosion. It's probably related to uh, neutron stars and magnetars, very intense astrophysics that's going on, that every once in a while, we see about three of them, four of them per day with, with that CHIME telescope, emits more light than the entire sky combined in the radio band. And that light travels across the cosmos and arrives at planet Earth. And I'd like to capture it. And most telescopes can't see it at all because when they look at the sky, they do a long exposure. Just like if you take your camera out and you wanna take an exposure of a bunch of stars, you're probably gonna set the exposure to be a 60th of a second, a second, two seconds. Most of our telescopes do that in order to have the sensitivity to see what's out there. Chime is fast enough to take an image, actually every microsecond, but we, we typically average them down to a millisecond and see these fast bursts so that we can start to answer those questions. Now there's other talks on the science of fast radio bursts and the science that we're able to do with them as probes, um, but it does set some of my goals as, in building telescopes. So we're about to get on to uh, this, this, this new version of telescopes. And what I've shown you so far hasn't had people in it. And it's really important to see that some of the faces of the people uh, that, that, that are building these things. And all the faces that are shown here, uh, well, almost all the faces that are shown here are graduate students, uh, new uh, uh, PhD researchers and undergraduate students that are working hand in hand with seasoned old boring professors or seasoned uh, uh, scientists and engineers to both design the telescope, to characterize it, and to put it together. And it's, it's important because when we put in the proposal to build this thing, we did not have the technology in hand to do it. We proposed, we said, hey, give us the money. Here's what we want to build. We think it'll cost this much. And on page like 37 of the proposal, we said, oh, and by the way, we don't have an amplifier yet that's low enough noise, but we're working on it. And no one's ever networked, put together that much data per second ever anywhere, but don't worry, we're working on it. And so, you know, we didn't go to a design house or a third party company or Honeywell Aerospace and say, give us a quote for this telescope. Because you can't do that. We went out and we found the smartest people and we didn't necessarily care if they had PhDs yet or not. And we assembled them in teams with, a, with experienced people and inexperienced people. And we set about building prototypes and parts of the telescope to demonstrate it and then ultimately to put it together. And we ran out of money, so the scientists had to run the cables themselves instead of hiring people to do it. And we had lots of fun uh, along those lines. And some of these people that started out as just undergraduates uh, working on it are now the, the professors and faculty members that are in other universities across Canada and North America designing new telescopes and so forth. 
Okay, so here's one of the challenges of a telescope like Chime. I showed you this cigar-like beam on the left, and man, if the world was like that, science would be easy. But it turns out the telescope we built, and we knew this as we put it together, the way that it sees the sky, the beam is, and this is a measurement, this is real uh, data of how we look at the sky, is this thing on the right. I wish it was a beautiful oval cigar, but actually it, it puts some of my great aunts knitting to shame how much structure and uh, plaid stuff there is on the right and the left-hand side. So when we look at the sky, we're able to deconvolve, to understand what happens in this main beam, but we also see a lot of extra sky. And the precision of chime to look at the sky isn't as good as I would like it to be. And this is exactly what we intended because chime is a discovery machine. We wanted to put it out there and see everything that's up there in the night sky and discover those wild, fast radio bursts and see new kinds of bursts and put together a, 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 a census of the overhead sky and the cosmos seeing everything rather than doing the precision science that follows once you've surveyed things. You go out and say, hey, what's out there with a telescope like Chime? And then you come in and you build the precision uh, uh, machine that's going to sort it out in detail. And the precision machine is what these people are, are working on now in terms of development and building. So this is a map of, of, of North America and Chime is this red dot here and I've shown it as a cartoon. What we're building now is a set of 500 radio telescopes, 500 dishes that sit beside it. And it's called CORD, the Canadian Hydrogen Observatory and Radio Transient Detector. We just received news from uh, the Canadian government that we were funded to build this um, uh, at the very beginning of, of, of this year. Um, so it's a, a major new project. It'll be uh, by far the most expansive telescope project built on Canadian soil, uh, certainly in the last 50 years, probably ever. Um, and in addition to its main, main station uh, in Penticton, British Columbia, it'll also have two smaller stations, just like Chime has, or that we're building for Chime, that has a set of dishes out there as well. And that's what gives us our angular resolution. In the same way that that big fast telescope in China is half a kilometer wide, this telescope is going to have arms of it that are 3,000 kilometers away and 1,000 kilometers away. So we can really uh, see very small structures on the night sky. And we do that by playing some tricks with our, our data analysis. Um, and, and we don't actually, we're not actually able to image everything with those, those extra stations, but it allows us to really zero in and see where our fast radio transients are coming from. This is what the site uh, might look like once, once we get things together. Here's uh, Chime over here on the right-hand side and these 500 dishes that are laid out beside it. The total surface area is about double what Chime was. Okay, the building blocks for this is a, a lot of the experience and the technology that we put together for, for Chime, that first telescope. Uh, for a sense of scale and in, in timeline, Chime was funded in 2012. So we were told by the government that we were allowed to build it. And we turned it on, we saw first light, we recorded our first images in 2017, and we published our first science papers about two years later um, because we were spending our time characterizing and understanding the instrument. So that whole timeline is about eight years from uh, being handed a big, big check to doing science with it. Um, CORD is meant to turn on uh, in 2024, so about three years from now, uh, and, and uh, 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 the science to follow shortly after. Our toolbox here is the site. Canada has a fantastic location for doing radio astronomy. Um, and the, uh, these precision dishes, and I'll show you some about them. And then finally, our, our ability to have really wide uh, bandwidth. Of course, the other big thing in our toolbox is that there's all these people that uh, uh, earn their degrees in their career building and putting Chime together. And most, uh, many of these people uh, that were the young trainees involved are are now the, the more senior people leading parts of this project. So the most important thing in CORD is to build something that sees the sky, that has a beam on the sky that is very, very precise. That plaid structure I showed a while ago um, needs to be replaced with a structure that's accurate to about one part in a thousand. So um, the, the dishes, the surfaces that we're using are fiberglass surfaces that are built exactly like we build canoes. I guess it shouldn't be surprising that here in Canada, when we develop a new radio telescope, we use canoe technology to, uh, 
to, to, to develop our instruments. So the, the, uh, the structure you see in the bottom right-hand corner is a great big mold. It's a surface that's very, very precise. It's precise to a fraction, uh, uh, it's precise to about 100 microns. The chime surface is, is accurate to about 20 centimeters. So this is orders and orders of magnitude more precise. And we lay up on top of it a, a, a fiberglass structure that has metal embedded in it that becomes the dish surface. And I'll show you uh, how that works. This is that mold as we first bought it. This is all done at, at the National uh, Research Council in, uh, in, in Penticton. It comes in, in four pieces and we put it together. We buy the best mold we can afford from the best company making molds and it's not good enough. So a whole, a whole bunch of uh, engineers and scientists get together and anywhere that we measure that the mold is a little bit deformed in the downwards direction, we add surface to it and we, uh, sand, we sand that surface and shape that surface and then we remeasure it with laser tracking to get it just right. And we build a surface that's as precise as possible and we measure over and over and over again until it's just right. Then we lay some layers of, of, of fiberglass on and then finally we lay in a metal mesh structure. So this is a metal dish but it's metal like a bridal veil. It's a thin layer of metal that's embedded inside the fiberglass. And then we lay more fiberglass on, we vacuum seal it, we, we, we compress it with, with a vacuum and inject the resins that harden. And then, then eventually you end up with a dish that looks uh, something like this. This is a, a dish that's just been pulled off the mold. Um, and here's uh, uh, a graduate student for scale. He's actually a relatively short graduate student for scale, but a graduate student for scale standing in, in the dish. Um, and another graduate student, Elizabeth here, is very precisely measuring where that bridal veil uh, mesh fits, uh, uh, stands within, within the fiberglass structure so that we can get a very accurate dish bill. It's been exciting over the last few months because we built one of our end-to-end -end prototypes for, for Cord just recently. This is that same dish. It's been painted now. Uh, we'd like the dish to be as cool as possible to reflect the sunlight. So of course we paint it a uh, very special uh, paint of white that reflects light, not just in the, in the optical, but also uh, reflects infrared light. And uh, um, uh, uh, two engineers, taller engineers this time, uh, standing in front of it for, for scale. Uh, we put our first dish in place about a month ago, a month and a half ago, um, uh, pulled off the mold, painted, and with its feed structure, which is shown, uh, shown right here, so we can test it. This is one of the really nice things about building an instrument like, like Cord. Cord is 512 copies of this dish. So we can afford very early on in the game to build everything, to build everything in one dish end to end, put it on the sky and measure all of its properties, which is our, our main, main uh, goal this year. One of the other things that's kind of novel and nice about this, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, there's this structure that uh, holds the dish and allows us to choose uh, which angle it points at. There's no motors there. It's, it's a hand choice where, where it points. But all, all of this is built of just flat sheet metal that is robotically laser cut and then like origami folded into these shapes and then put together by a robot and spot welded in, in place. So part of our, our uh, project of putting this together is to learn how to do things as low cost, as robotically and repeatable as possible. I don't much care where this dish ends up pointing in the end. When I talk with uh, 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 the engineers that are doing the detailed design of this metal hardware, I don't much care where it points but every one of those 500 dishes has to point in precisely the same direction. So I, did, I care about the repeatability, not the absolute pointing. And that all feeds in, into, the, into the design. Um, here's uh, one of our graduate student heroes, Elizabeth, putting the feed in place so that we can look through this dish for the first time and see how it sees the sky. You see all these little dots here, which are uh, uh, stickers that allow us to take photos of, uh, of the dish and then with 3D software, we take photos at different angles. We can figure out exactly where the surface of the dish is and find out if the dish deforms or moves as we rotate it uh, in, in, in different directions. The second really important part of this. So the first one I just showed you is that we want a surface, we want a dish that's precise, like no radio telescope that's ever been built. And it's small and easy to, well, not easy to build, it's small, but then we have to repeat it 500 times. The next thing I want to do is I want to record more bandwidth, more colors than what we've been able to do with other telescopes and what we've been able to do with Chime. 
So, so we've been working very closely with the team at, at the University of, of Toronto to, to develop these feeds. Okay, when I say work very closely, they've been doing fantastic development and we've been watching in awe as they put it together. Uh, we've, uh, we've been developing these feeds that have many different wavelength scales so that this feed can equally record light that's about 1.5 gigahertz in, in, in frequency, about 20 centimeters, as well as, as frequencies that are about uh, five times longer than that. So we have much wider bandwidth, we can see more colors. And these uh, feed structures are able to do that. It's not enough to find an engineer or a scientist that can make a wide band feed. We have to find someone, we have to work together with our, our, our partners to find people who can make them reproducibly and stamp out 500 of them for a reasonable price. So you, you see these things fit together kind of like Lego. They're laser cut out of sheet metal, just regular everyday metal. They're laser cut and then assembled together to form these beautiful uh, feed structures like these. Okay, people, 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 <laughs> part of my emphasis here because it's these, these people uh, that, that put, put these things together and that when we dream up these projects and write our proposals and ask the government, and really that means the taxpayers proxied through the government to trust us with their funding, with their money to build these telescopes. We really aren't able to tell them that we can do it. We're really not able to tell them that a feed like the one I just showed you exists uh, and we can put 500 of them together to build that cord telescope. What we have to tell them in our proposal is that we have a good idea, a good hint of how we might do that. And that we, we have really smart partners, really smart physicists, engineers, and astronomers behind it that are get, going to succeed in, in their mission of, of designing those feeds, designing that dish, and be able to do it at a cost that's affordable for, for the telescope. So uh, this comes back to that statement that all of this isn't just about people, uh, isn't just about technology. It's really a question of the people uh, putting it together. And those people have uh, all sorts of backgrounds and histories and expertise. And our team absolutely has to be a team that has, you know, the key crack hitter in mechanical engineering, but also the key uh, uh, crack hitter in signal processing and the creativity to think outside what's normally done because the telescope we end up building is definitely not one that we can look up and has been put together uh, somewhere else. Okay. I'm going to, uh, I've shown you lots of pictures. Uh, maybe I've, I've generated some discussion and, and questions. So I'm, I'm gonna stop here and uh, uh, conclude. I'm gonna um, summarize that our modern exploration is, is a different one from what we have been doing in the past, at least the one that uh, I'm trusted with doing in the telescopes that I build. It's about seeing the cosmos, but about traveling in both space and time. We're on this journey to build a new type of telescope, a telescope that isn't a big machine that we steer around in point places, but a telescope that's really a great big computer that records all the waves, all, all the information that falls across a field of instrumentation, records those light waves and signals, and then processes them to reconstruct the image of the night sky. And that science is being driven by this new technology that exists, really cheap amplifiers, really big computers, and most importantly, the people that sit behind it to put it together. So uh, as, as we look forward in time, we're seeing uh, an image of astronomy and surveys on the night sky that isn't just looking at objects, that isn't putting together pieces by pointing here and there, but is instead recording images that is the whole sky every night. And that's doing that at fast exposure rates that, so that we can make not just images, but movies of the explosions and the changes of the night sky. Okay, thanks, uh, Alia. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, send it back to you to moderate and we can go forward. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt. I, I love learning about the technology. It's, 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 it's the physics behind the physics. Okay, so we've got questions already for Matt, but uh, if you've got questions now, please type them into the chat if you're on Zoom. If you'd rather not show your question to everyone, you can type it to our moderator, Carolina. And if you're on YouTube, type them in the comments and they will be fed down, fed down to me. So uh, first question, how far back in time can you see with Chime? Yeah, so um, Chime is, 
In, in the main way that we look back in time with Chime, we see back to when the universe was about one fifth of its present age. So our universe today is roughly 14 billion years old. And we see back to one fifth of that. Um, and now I shouldn't do math in my head, but that's about 2.2 billion uh, light years after the Big Bang. Um, now, there is a possibility we, we can see even further if there's bright explosions that are further away than that, um, because those could be bright enough to see. Right. Thank you. Uh, and we've got someone who's aware of the fact that there's the James Webb telescope being launched very shortly uh, and is excited, excited about that. And they were wondering how does uh, CHIME and how do CHIME and CORD compare to the Webb telescope? Yeah. Yeah, the James Webb Telescope is going to be a revolution in the way we, we see this guy, but it's a revolution at a completely different wavelength. So the James Webb Space Telescope is seeing things mostly, not exactly the same way, but, but, but similar to the, op, uh, uh, the, the optical signals that you see with you, your, your, your eyes, whereas our CHIME Telescope and CORD is seeing these really long wavelengths. So there's quite a bit of science we can actually do that's complementary between the two. There will be astronomers absolutely that definitely download the maps that we make of the night sky in radio bands, apply for and get time on the James Webb uh, telescope and look at very dif distant galaxies, for example, and compare those to what we see at the same, same region of, of the sky. These things, uh, you, you, there's, not, there's no direct light that both telescopes would see. Now, almost all radio astronomy is done from the ground with ground-based telescopes like Cord and Chime. Because the wavelengths are big, that means that the telescopes are macroscopic in size. The, the, uh, um, the, the telescope needs to have a collecting area that's many, many hundreds of square meters for most science. There, are, uh, radio tele there have been radio telescopes on satellites, but they're, they're a very different uh, beast or animal. Hey, thank you. Um, we've got a couple people asking, what would be the difference if you could build 100 cord dishes instead of 50 or 10 instead of 50, something like that? Yeah, yeah. So in terms of what we can see, um, how, okay, so there's, there's, there's two things that are important here. One is the amount of light that we collect. The amount of signal that we see when there's explosion far away is just directly proportional to how big the telescope is. It's just a bucket and we put light in the bucket and you know, the more collecting area we have, the brighter we, uh, the, the more signal we have from those, those distant explosions. So the bigger we build the telescope, the more dishes we, we put in, um, the, the, the more faint explosions we can see. That might mean that we can see further away or it might mean that we see local things that are very, very faint. So we want lots of dishes uh, for collecting areas that we can bag more photons. The other thing is that I, I want my dishes to be right next to each other because of some details in the signal processing and, and how that allows us to make our, our images. Um, so I won't go into why, but I want them basically to touch each other. Um, that, that allows us to search the sky very quickly. But now how far away the dishes end up being defines the smallest size thing I can see on the sky. So since I already need to close pack them in order to make them further away, then I need to build more and more dishes. So cord is gonna be 512 dishes. If only the taxpayers were richer, if our country had a better economy, I would have asked for 5,000 dishes. And you know, if, if it was better than that, I would have asked for 50,000. But 500 dishes is basically set by, um, you know, it's, it's an order of magnitude more, more powerful than our existing telescope. So it's worth doing. And it's also about the most money that a, a country like Canada is willing to spend right now in this sort of science. Makes sense, thank you for that. Um, are there similar telescopes to CHIME available in other countries? Um, yes and no. <laughs> okay, so it's a, it's a, a complicated uh, a question. Uh, question. Chime is really unique in how, how it looks at the sky and its cylinder shape is completely unique in, in the type of telescope it is. There are other cylindrical shaped telescopes, but the way they instrument and record their data is very different. So they're a different class of radio telescope, even though they may look a little bit similar. Chime is very unique in, in how much of the sky it sees and that fast exposure rate. And there are other telescopes that can see these fast radio bursts. Um, but for example, CHIME has recorded more of these fast radio bursts than the entire world's other telescopes combined. 
And I don't just mean more, it's recorded like 20 times more than all the other telescopes on planet Earth combined for these fast radio bursts. So Chime is very unique that way. There are other telescopes that don't point, that just stare up at, at the night sky. And most other uh, teams globally that have been building those work at longer wavelengths for a different type of science. They're trying to see the birth of the first stars as opposed to the fast radio transits or the structure of, of, of matter today. And, and Chime is a very close cousin to those, those other telescopes. Uh, oh, and um, there is a whole private group that builds Chime-like telescopes. You will not be able to tell the, di the difference between the Chime telescope and uh, this group that uses them for radar. They're, they're trying to map every, uh, every structure that's floating by with satellites down to about two centimeters on the night sky. It's a private group that's uh, um, uh, out of uh, California. Uh, a Canadian actually leads the technological uh, development there. And if you Google uh, Kiwi space radar, their first one was put in New Zealand. Uh, and you'll see an image that looks very much like Chime, but that's not a telescope, it's a radar. It transmits radio waves up into the sky and it sees those radio waves reflect and bounce off objects like airplanes and satellites and space debris. And then it figures out where those things are. And in that case, it's for profit. It sells that information to space agencies, to other people who wanna track space debris. Hey, thank, thank you. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, uh, next next question. Uh, does people standing on the dishes damage them? Yeah, the dishes are really, really uh, uh, strong and, and robust, much like a, a canoe. We can bend and deform our dishes uh, without changing the shape that they bounce back to. But those people standing on the dishes wouldn't even def uh, deform the dish. We have a requirement that that entire dish, when it's full of snow and sitting in a hundred kilometer an hour winds doesn't die. And at uh, 10, I think it was a 10, 7.8 meters per second wind, which is a really windy day, that the, the, the movement of, of the dish is robust and still enough that we can still make very precise measurements. So it turns out that, you know, while, while you might think, oh, you can build a very thin, beautiful uh, structure with it, those structures actually have to be incredibly robust to withstand the storms that, that we're getting today, both in terms of snowstorms and windstorms. And then to make sure that on 90% of, of the days, no matter how windy it is on 90, uh, up to the maximum wind speed on 90% of the days, we can keep looking through these telescopes and see precise images. So they're way over, way, way, way over engineered for standing on um, because those other requirements dominate. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Um, yeah, how long, how long did it take to build Chime? Um, Chime, we were funded in 2012 and we turned it on for the first time in 2017. Um, we spent about two, two or three years doing prototypes and technology development, so not building uh, a Chime. And the total build time was about two years. Okay. And for a big radio telescope like that, that is incredibly fast. To go from funding to, to a telescope on the sky in five years is, is, is uh, almost unheard of. Um, but, you know, I'm not claiming that we're special. We have an easier job because a lot of our telescope is computers and, and antennas and things like that, and not big structures that move and rotate and so forth. Um, so that, that's helped us a lot in our speed. And we're trying to up the game with CORE to build it even faster. Yeah, that, that is really fast. Um, what would happen if you weren't able to develop some of the technology required for a telescope that you put in a proposal? What would happen with the funding? Um, at some level, our confidence is very, very high that we can do something that is good enough to do some sort of science with, uh, to do really, really good science, to be better than anything else that's built so far. But the thing, our goal, you know, we're, we're motivated to do it because we, we have our, 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 our target goal. And uh, um, so, so the end result is we would build it anyway. The government would uh, continue to fund us unless, you know, we turned around and said, actually, you know, we're not a factor of two worse, but we're a factor of 10 worse. Then, you know, not only would the government probably want their money back before we spend it, but the scientists and engineers that I've put together to work with me to build it, they would walk away. They would go work on something else because they're not going to spend the next five years 
building some, you know, the thing that we claim is the ultimate next telescope that's going to be just like every other one. So, you know, it's not just that the government should have a watchdog in place to oversee us. The scientists and engineers themselves would turn back to the government and say, hey, you know, we, we did the R&D, we, we developed our prototype, we spent a tiny bit of the money developing it, but here, take it back because, you know, we're not as good as we thought, as we hoped we were. And uh, we don't want to build this thing that isn't as good as, as, as we hoped. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, and I'm very confident that whatever comes forward with, with CORD, actually with this prototype we already have on the sky, is, is far exceeding any other telescope out there uh, now. So we'll, we'll go forward. But if there was a, a crazy showstopper, if, um, I don't know, the, there was a world shortage of these amplifiers or world shortage of steel that made the price such that we just couldn't afford it anymore, and we could only build 100 dishes instead of 500, those 100 dishes wouldn't be competitive with, with our own CHIME telescope. It would be different, but not, not groundbreaking. And we'd probably stop and you know, talk with the government and either say, you know, help us do more with more money, or um, we're going to move on to the next project. Okay, make, make sense. Um, and yeah, and good to hear. Um, another user asking about funding, uh, how much of you has been spent on maintenance for Chime? Yeah. Um, Chime is, a, is very different from most telescopes because it doesn't move and that makes it really inexpensive to operate. Our power bill is pretty monstrous because we have huge computers behind it. We spend about $200,000 per year on electricity. Um, so that's, you know, that's comparable to uh, a, uh, a town of 200 houses or so. Um, and so we spend a lot of, you know, a lot of money on power and we actually only have one full-time operator that uh, maintains the telescope, that changes computers out, reboots things and so forth. And almost all the other manpower is supplied by graduate students, professors and so forth that uh, take turns uh, operating and running the telescope. So CHIME is one of the lowest cost telescopes on planet earth for its, its uh, uh, you know, the ratio of the operating expense to the construction expense is one of the lowest. Most telescopes sit at about seven to nine percent, and Chime sits at a, a percent or two. Um, so that uh, that that bodes well for for telescopes like this. Oh, yeah. Chime is also, by the way, one of the most COVID-friendly telescopes, in the sense that it used to be one of the worst things we saw was airplanes flying overhead. Uh, airplanes and, and anytime there's forest fires in the region, the, the emergency response uh, uh, airplanes and helicopters for that are just uh, terrible for us. You can imagine you're making movies in the night sky and something zips across it. You know, your, com your computers say, hey, there's something going on. And that's annoying. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, when, when the pandemic hit, our data got really good. The airplanes stopped flying. Um, yeah, people stopped traveling. Um, the, the chatter on... on um, on, on, on technology that we see with our telescope was, was much, much better. So yeah, it's terrible for constructing and designing a new telescope where you need people traveling and working and designing things, but it's great for a telescope like Chime that doesn't require people to go there to look through it, to operate it, um, and just sits there and records data. Yeah, nice. Good for the night sky, good for the birds and bees, good. Uh, one, someone asked, uh, what's the power in watts of the signal that you receive? So that's related to the, one of the main operating costs of the electricity. Uh, wait, the power in oh, watts that we consume or the power in watts of, of a signal we see in the sky? Of a signal, uh, okay. apologies. Power, sorry, the power in watts that we consume about 200 uh, 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 kilowatts. Um, the power of a signal that we see on the sky, a typical like super bright signal, like just knock you over bright signal is a Jansky. And a Jansky corresponds to uh, one times 10 to the negative 26. So 0 0.26 zeros, then a one watts per bandwidth per, per, per second. So it's a very, very faint signal. So, you know, if you happen to be walking on the moon with Neil Armstrong and you dropped your cell phone there and left it there, that would be like, that would be a killer bright signal for us. We would, uh, we would have no trouble um, listening in on all of your conversations and understanding everything your cell phone is doing on the moon. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then 
Is cord meant to do long baseline interferometry or of radio signals, but with a fast exposure rate? Absolutely. Um, that's that's a, a great question. I didn't have time to go into that in any detail. So in very long baseline interferometry, what we do is we take signals from a core station. This is the cord station here in Penticton. And we also record uh, signals at these very distant locations. And we basically take these distant locations and use them as part of a pretend huge radio dish that includes uh, those dots. So imagine that you have a radio dish that, that covers this whole region. Uh, that includes the, the plane that's formed by, by these three points. And then it's just sparsely populated. We don't have information everywhere, but we sample these three points. CORD is able to do that so that we can take these fast exposure rates and then zoom in and see very precisely where things are in the night sky. So what that means is that when there's a fast radio burst, an explosion of light, um, that is this millisecond uh, a duration, we cannot just see where it is in the night sky, we can see where it is on, on the night sky and which galaxy it's in. And then we can zoom into within that galaxy and see where within the galaxy very precisely that explosion happened. Now, we, we completely cheated when we did this. To do that all the time with a constant movie going off all the time would require linking these telescopes together with big fiber optic cables that we could never afford on our, our Canadian scale budget. So instead what we do is all these three telescopes are operating completely independently. They're just sitting there and they're recording data. And the amount of data that they're recording is immense. We cannot afford to, to write these, the, this data to, to hard disks at all. So what they do is they have some memory in each of these outrigger, these distant telescopes, and they're filling up the memory. And as soon as it fills up, they just uh, take out the last data and put new data in. And we store about a second of data. Oh, well, okay, 100 seconds of, of data or so. And what happens is when CHIME sees something of interest, it triggers, it sends a signal to these other telescopes, a tiny amount of data, right? We just need to send a cell phone text message and say, hey guys, stop, stop recording data and take everything that's in your memory buffer and save it to a hard drive. It takes us a while to write that out to the hard drive. And then we ship that information back very slowly over the internet. So absolutely, we do very long baseline astronomy and we take movies and we're always taking movies but our movie has a limited duration of about a hundred seconds. We record the movies for all time, but we only save to disk a fraction of them. It's like that new, not that new anymore, that function in your iPhone, the live uh, videos where you actually take movies at the full resolution of your camera, not the low resolution that the video part of your iPhone does, but the full resolution of your camera. Those are limited to just a second in length. And that's not because Apple didn't want you to go two seconds or three seconds. It's because the, the buffer of that, how fast it can write out that data. It can't keep up with a movie camera with your little I iPhone. It's buffering it right in that second camera and it only can write out a second of it. This is kind of what CORD is going to end up doing. It can make short duration movies, but fortunately we have our core station, uh, the CORD main station, and it's going to tell us when there's action on the sky and we're going to record anytime there's action on the sky. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's neat. Um, we're wondering, uh, is it possible that green sol solar energy could uh, power chime? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we don't care. You know, we don't care at all where our electricity comes from. We need electricity. And um, solar energy is a little bit hard because our best data is at night. And it's not, you know, an optical telescope, it's nice when the sun sets because, you know, there's not stray light around. With a radio telescope, we can observe during the day or we can observe at night. It's almost the same thing, but, but there's a lot of activity during the day. People talk on their cell phones. They broadcast stuff during the day. So our best data is always at night. So if we wanted to build a field of solar panels, we would also have to build a great big battery so that we could make sure that we run through the night. And in British Columbia, we kind of have that. The battery is the hydro dams, right? The rivers flow, they fill up hydro dams and we turn them on when we need electricity. And the electricity from this is flowing through through hydro dams. So at some level, you know, we are using a one form of, 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 of renewable energy that's different from, from solar panels, but the flow of that energy is most important to us and we need most of our power at night. It's not that we need most, but we have to get through the night. Right, that makes sense, thanks. Uh, last question as we close out the night, do theoretical physicists understand your work? 
Our role in the scientific world is to judge the theorists. And, and I mean that in, in some way. So, you know, I have very wonderful close friends who are theorists that make uh, theories of the early universe. And my job is to listen to those theories and figure out what they look like on the sky or task those people, those women and men that make those theories and say, hey, cool theory. I love your equations. That's kind of nice. Now, what does the sky look like if your theory is true? And then to be completely agnostic about which theory comes out and to measure the skies and compare them to that. Yes, the theoretical physicists understand the end product of the sky maps we measure for sure. And uh, we actually have a couple uh, uh, people who started out as theorists that are now uh, key in designing some of the, the most complex algorithms that we use to sort through, through our data. So I would say those theorists understand parts of the telescope much better than I do. Um, but yes, there's, there's uh, you know, certainly the mechanical engineering of the mount of the telescope. Uh, most theorists have no need to understand that. And to a large amount, you know, I love to read about the equations of the early universe and how they fit together. But in all frankness, it doesn't matter whether I understand them or not. I ask the theorist for the realization of the night sky. I compare that to the data. And no matter how good of a friend that theorist is, you know, my, I can only falsify their theory. I can only prove them wrong by falsifying their predictions. And then, you know, some predictions have survived and not yet been proven wrong, or maybe they're, they're the truth. And uh, that's, uh, that's where we go in the other direction. All right, great. Thank you so much, Matt. So that brings us to the end of this hour. Uh, we apologize if we, couldn't, if we couldn't get to your questions, but please type your thanks to Matt in the chat before you leave. If you're on YouTube, type them in the YouTube comments. Uh, we'll make sure that he gets to see that. And with that, that concludes our lecture this evening. So happy holidays, everyone. We'll see you in the new year with a panel on quantum information. All right. Bye. Great. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.